So it's 11 o'clock and we'll get started. Good morning, my name is Jan Schmitz from the Edmonton Pride Seniors Group. It's February 23rd and thank you all for attending our weekly Aging with Pride session. Our group is for the two SLGTPQ2IA seniors and their allies. Thank you too to our partners, SAGE and the Pride Center of Edmonton. Before I introduce our speaker, Speakers, I must acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory and respect the histories, languages, and cultures of First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and all First Peoples of Canada, whose presence continues to enrich our lives. I must let you know that this session is being recorded for future use on our YouTube channel. If you don't wish your image to be recorded, please close your video feed. And now, with great pleasure, I would like to introduce our speakers. Born in Edmonton, Guy was the first chair of the education committee at HIV Edmonton. After 17 years as an outpatient social worker at the Southern Alberta HIV Clinic in Calgary, he and his husband retired to Vancouver Island for 11 years. They returned to Edmonton in 2018, longing to be closer to cultural ven venues and to bask in the winter sun having tired of six months of winter rain on the West Coast. They are both delighted in the opportunities afforded by the standardized patient program at the U of A's facility of Dent dentistry and medicine. He is also a volunteer at the Alberta, at the AGA, that must be the Art Gallery of Alberta, helping to improve programming for seniors. <laughs> Petra Duncan originally hails from Southern England and began working at the University of Alberta in 2008 as a standardized patient trainer for the standardized patient program, the SPP, at the Health Science Education and Research Commons. Today, the SPP is run out of one of the top health academies on, cam on campus. It's housed in the Edmonton Clinic Health Academy on campus. Petra has a background in business and also in the theater industry, having been involved in acting, directing, and playwriting. Currently, she is the simulation educator at the center, preparing and training standardized patients to provide simulated experiences in a safe environment for our health team, students of the future. She is thrilled to be here and wants to thank everyone for the opportunity to present the Simulation Center and the SP program to, your, to our organization. Over to you, Guy. Thank you, Jen, for a very warm welcome. Um, I was thinking that all of us would understand that when you retire, one of the things you search for is some place where you can participate in life, use your knowledge, your skills, um, and do something meaningful and you know, perhaps contribute to society or the community or to the next generation. And it took me a long time to find a program like this. When I'm at the art gallery, what I do is I cut paper. <laughs> and when I, I did the income tax program with Sage and the CRA for a couple of years, and it was a nightmare. The computers were always go doing stupid things and you didn't know how to solve the problem. So this program is perfect. It's just enough. It uses your knowledge. It lets you to be a community actor and it gives you chances to learn and have fun with other people. So I'm really delighted to be able to speak about it. Um, it was an exercise buddy at the Y who told me about the program. And he encouraged me to apply. And I did that online, filled out a very straightforward application. And in about a couple of months, it takes them a couple of months to actually interview you because they have a backlog of folks who are trying to get in. Um, they gave us a simple screen test. <laughs> so it's a real simple uh, scenario. And they basically are just seeing if you can memorize things, if you can stay on track, and if you can handle straightforward medical questions. So I passed. And it was a slow beginning, but it has gotten more and more involved over the last couple of years. So during COVID, it was awesome because I was able to stay busy. Once a week, I got out of the house to do something. Um, the pay is uh, modest, but it's lovely. Um, they basically pay us $16 an hour for simple things. 
and up to $25 for more complicated things. They always pay us for a minimum of three hours and they give us a parking allowance. So if it's under four hours, we get $7. And I think if it's over that, we get 12. That's right. Um, so basically I was reminded to say, it's not enough to live on. It's not a regular job, but it really helps for, you know, body massages or a piece of art that, you know, one needs to have. <laughs> I bought all my lawn furniture when I was an SP. There you go. It's perfect. <laughs> so we see this incredible range of uh, students and an incredible range of professions. When we start with the first year medical students, they have us um, as physical examination models. So basically, we just sit on a hospital bed wear a hospital gown and the doctors start to teach them about the basics of heart, lung, liver, spleen, and all of the other stuff in the middle. And one of the funniest moments I recall was the quite seasoned doc walking up to my torso and looking at his students and in my chest and saying, now, remember in anatomy, do you remember where his liver should be? And they're all going, yeah, yeah. Well, imagine his liver here. And so he touches my liver. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, but I'm still breathing. And then <laughs> he got them to do their thing. It's really funny to see them, the brand new students. They're very keen, they're enthusiastic. In one of the classes, they walk in with their stethoscopes in boxes, unassembled, and they're in there pulling all this stuff out and trying to figure out how to screw them together and what goes, and they're comparing ends and they all discover they have different ends and they discover they're the wrong ones and they're all freaking out. And, and the doc walks in and says, it's okay. I will teach you how to use this one. It's pediatric, but we can use it. And they're going, oh, thank God. <laughs> anyway, so that's, that's the first year. The first years are pretty straightforward. You're just there. With the second years, uh, they change it up and in more serious. They use us for a whole bunch of course examinations. And so in the second year, they give them quite a cross section of topics. And uh, the one that I recall was uh, an exam I did for sexual history taking. And what my role was is I was a 40 year old guy living in a same sex relationship. We had just adopted a kid. I was impotent, but I couldn't use the words because I didn't know them. I was really shy and uncomfortable about talking about it. And I somehow had to communicate to this poor student that that's why I was there and that I needed some guidance. So in the midst of this presentation, unexpectedly for me, I started crying. And this poor student was beside himself he couldn't believe I was there doing this, crying. I was afraid that my partner was going to leave me with a little girl. Anyway, when we were finished, he turned to his preceptor and said to her, he cried. And she goes, looks at him sympathetically and goes, yes, they cry every day. <laughs> and he looks at her then and says, I didn't know what to do. And he just threw up his arms in frustration. She said, it's all right, sweetie, sit down. We're going to spend 45 minutes talking about it. So it was, uh, it was quite something. Um, I'm just thinking that I might have missed one thing. Yeah. When we get to the fourth year students, it's a very significant moment for them because they have to pass our a very serious national exam to show that they have all the basic competencies to get released into a residency program and also to do more serious work in hospitals. So when we do the national exams for the fourth years, one of the characteristics of the exam is that they're held across the country at the same time. And all the students across the country have to be asked the same questions. So they're very tight with us. We have to memorize an opening statement. We have to have a whole bunch of oblique answers 
to unexpected questions so that we don't mislead them or get them off on the wrong track. And um, we have to be very sober and respectful of the examiner who's also in the room. So those ones are much more nerve wracking. Nerve wracking for us, I feel sorry for the poor students because they have to go through 20 or 16 scenarios, one after the other every 10 minutes. So they really have to show their stuff. But it's fascinating as a volunteer doing it because we're listening for different kinds of things. So one of the things we're listening to is, are they using open-ended questions versus closed-end questions? It's one of the biggest struggles they have with the students is to encourage them to always ask open-ended questions. And then the other one, it's our favorite little trick that Patriot always is teaching us about. The students, like we're living with the iPhone generation and they love to ask questions in threes. So they'll do things like smoking, drinking, drugs. And so we're trained to answer the last question. So the, I'll be a 70 year old and they'll ask me a question like that. And I'll say, no drugs. But they missed all about my bottle a day and my cigarette smoking. And I say nothing unless they bring it up. So they're, they have to learn to ask one thing at a time and go slow and give people time to uh, answer that stuff. So those were like, that's kind of a paint, a little picture about working with medical students. Um, I was gonna just paint a picture of working just with a few other disciplines. And the one that I remember I did just before Christmas with, was with occupational therapy. And they were just completing their course on mental health. And uh, so in that scenario, I was a fellow with PTSD. I'd just been discharged from the armed forces. I was depressed, I was angry, I was drinking too much. I, we always drink too much. <laughs> and uh, I was there because I wanted to be a real man and get a job again. So, you know, that's really easy for me to do. <laughs> anyway, the most fascinating thing to me about it was this OT students have, are being trained to use new tools. And one of the tools, they walked in and said to me, what's your favorite music? And I looked at them and went, hey, this is a 45 minute thing. This is an exam. Like, you don't care what I listen to. They said, no, no, no. We want to know your favorite music. I went, really? And they said, okay, I'm going to have fun with this. My favorite artist is Petula Clark. And they go, who? And I just went, hey, you wanted my music? I want Petula Clark. <laughs> so, of course, he whipped out his iPhone, typed her in. And for the next 45 minutes, we list to the best, the greatest hits of PC. <laughs> anyway, that was lots of fun. And then another set of students brought in this great big life board, board instead of their notes. And I said, well, what the hell is that for? And they said, oh, we're going to do your life history. And the upper quadrant is your external life and the below quadrant is your internal life. And we're going to make this lovely picture and make sense of it all and make you all better in 45 minutes and good luck with that anyway <laughs> it was lots of fun um another really fun story is when i worked at nate and that day they were training uh, a new cadre of professionals who are going to be both a combination phlebotomist and x-ray technician for emergency departments and so my role was to be a drunk and i was told to be sexist uncooperative um, and just make it as difficult as I possibly could. So there he was sitting in the emergency room, fast asleep, <laughs> unresponsive. <laughs> then they finally got me into a wheelchair. No sooner had they got me into the wheelchair that I innocently looked up at them and said, I have to pee. <laughs> and it totally messed them up. <laughs> when we dealt with that issue, <laughs> <laughs> they got me into the x-ray room and they couldn't decide how to get a drug onto the big x-ray bed and they figured out a compromise was just used by hand on the bed and as soon as they got themselves all ready to take the picture I went oh I have to throw up and again it just melted down they had no idea what to do with me so anyway those were some other professional groups we worked with the last one we just started doing work with is at the Cross Cancer Institute. And uh, 
There are done different kinds of things. One was I had to be a late stage cancer patient and the students had to tell me that I was dying. And that was kind of a remarkable uh, experience and also a lesson to me. They have to pass that course before they get to practice as students in a hospital. And one of the things I learned during that particular examination was Alberta has a brand new document called the Levels of Care. So you don't, you don't necessarily have to have your lawyer do your personal health directives. It's possible for you and your doc, it can be any healthcare professional, can construct the Levels of Care document. And it's quite clever in that it talks about give me everything, something in the middle or palliative care. And the something in the middle is the part that Alberta has really made flexible. And so you could say whatever you want for levels of care. So an example is you want everything but somebody to be on your chest to revive your heart. Um, but the most significant thing in how most of the students managed to fail that particular course is it's one of the few documents around that doesn't require a signature. And that was the last question. Does this document need a signature? And they all go, oh, of course it needs a signature. We've all been raised to sign, I always sign. It's the only document in healthcare that doesn't require a signature. Anyway, it was lots of fun and I learned a lot. Um, that's a lot of the people stuff. I'm gonna just mention one more thing and then turn it over. We're also learning about some new technologies and some dreams about how they would like healthcare to unroll in the future. And one part of the dream is to make ultrasounds available at the bedside rather than downstairs in another department. So they've developed both um, iPad size portable units that can be carried around a ward, or they're also adapting people's personal iPads to be used as ultrasounds. And they have these special things they plug into them that they call butterflies and they dial into some program and some computer and it becomes an ultrasound and they're the pictures are extraordinary and the techniques are amazing and we've done it now for about two years almost every month we're doing an ultrasound course and my partner is getting really good at telling them how to set up all the settings on their screens and how to adapt and how not to move that thing around and how to get under and around a rib and it, it, it's an amazing thing and for the docs, um, what they say is it helps us make quick, dirty diagnosis. We don't have to guess anymore. If we're pretty sure we can have a quick look, confirm that that's what it is, and then deal with it. Or when they're using all those lovely needles to like ex not ex <laughs> irrigate fluids from within, they, are, they don't miss and puncture an organ. They, uh, this ultrasound guides them through. So. It's, uh, it's kind of a remarkable thing. So when I reflect about all of this stuff, one of the things that's quite extraordinary to me over the four years is that there's such an incredible range of personalities um, involved in practice, wanting to practice medicine. And you start to appreciate how different skill sets and different personalities will fit in differently in different places. So. There's the odd one who just like shines and go, oh, they have to be in pediatrics or family medicine. And then you get the other who's brilliant, but they really need to be in pathology. And I know that Larry's here, so I thought I would throw that in just to give him a little amusement, but um, yeah. And then when I think about some of the side effects for, for me or benefits, unexpected benefits, we're always working with really uh, mature professionals who've been in their professions for like 40 years. So I've worked with the head of cardiology, the head of intensive care at the university, um, the head of the Rainbow Clinic at Grant McEwen University. And so we have these incredible conversations in between the students. And so it's been lots of fun just to talk to them. And we also see the incredible range of students coming. So there's clearly a gender balance between men and women. There's also folks who are trans who are wanting to practice medicine. And it's kind of a, it's, it's a really remarkable thing. And people from all over the world as well. 
here as students and you see them and you go, this is remarkable. And some of the most conservative folks you come across are really good at doing their stuff, like sexual history taking. It's, uh, you know, it's very humbling to see their skills and abilities. Um, I also learn more about my body and I think I'm, I can be now a better patient with my poor old family doctor who, uh, who twice now has seen me with SPs that he's training and they walk in with their SPs and I go, yeah, yeah, I know you're a second year student. <laughs> I know the drill. Anyway, um, we've met some incredible volunteers. We've had some incredible support from the staff and you know, it's just uh, one small effort in trying to help the next generation of practitioners be better and help the system be better. That's basically what I have to say. No Thank tears you, until later. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Guy. And um, it is, it, it's such, um, there's nothing more gratifying than receiving a handshake from students who thanks you for giving them the opportunity to practice before they go out there in the real world. Um, so thank you so much. So I'm gonna share my screen and I want everyone to give me a thumbs up if you can see it, okay? Um, just a minute, there we go. Cause I'm not best on technology, so I'm just gonna, there we go. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, yep. Yep. excellent, excellent. Okay, all right. Now see, all right. So welcome to the Standardized Patient Program. This building that you see in this first picture, that's where we're located. We're right opposite the University of Alberta Hospital um, and we're the colored glass building. Sometimes they call us the Lego building. Um, so let's just like that. So this is the agenda. Um, we've, and of course, um, uh, Jan gave us some lovely introductions and Guy's done the, um, done his uh, beautiful piece um, about what it's like to be a standardized patient. Um, now I'm going to just go through a little bit of information for you, uh, just so that you know. So we're going to start with what is a standardized patient? Because quite often when I tell people, oh, I'm a simulation educator, they all go, what does that mean? Um, so anyways, this here is the original definition. Many years ago, back in the day, Dr. Howard Barrows, back in the 60s, I believe, um, when he first started looking at simulation, um, this is what the original definition is. So a person who's been carefully coached to simulate an actual patient so accurately that the simulation cannot be detected by a skilled clinician. In performing the simulation, the simulated patient presents the gestalt of the patient being simulated, not just the history, but the body language, the physical findings, and the emotional and personality characteristics as well. So that's what we originally um, were designed with. And now a days it's changing rapidly because of course there are um, five different types of simulation, which I'm going to share with you. But now of course, we also say that a standardized patient is a person who's been coached to recreate the history, um, personality and physical findings of an actual patient in a realistic and consistent manner. Um, and so today we mainly do physicals, uh, interviews, histories, um, but we've had some very unusual uh, bookings. Uh, just this past week, we've been working with a group who are learning how to take an unconscious bariatric um, patient and be able to put them in a, um, a special lift and lift them out of the bed with all their tubes and all their stuff on them still. And how you do that gently um, so that you can take them to go for x-ray. Um, they're unconscious, they're dead weight, what do you do? Um, and so by using a standardized patient, they know when it hurts. Um, they know when they're prodding their eye 
or something like that. So, you know, these are all things that have been very important. Um, and these are not just students. We also have a lot of um, professionals, health professionals that come through to do courses here as well. So um, these pictures that you see are standardized patients that are in our program. Why do we do this work? Well, as you can see, there's quite a list as to why we educate. Um, reduction in student anxiety, educated feedback from patients' perspective, um, authenticity, consistency, and accuracy. The list goes on, and um, our, our main task is to provide a safe environment for the new doctors, nurses, um, and all healthcare professionals to practice their skills. And it's the old saying at the bottom there, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas because um, it needs to be a safe environment where it's okay to make mistakes. That's where you learn. And I always tell standardized patients, you are the learning tool. Real education happens afterwards uh, when in, during their briefings. So um, here you see um, a young girl and she's being coached actually by a nurse um, and um, she's very upset because her baby's very ill and um, she's being helped. And in the previous picture, you saw one of our uh, standardized patients with a broken arm and they're tending to it. So um, I've got lots of pictures to show you, but one of the styles of simulation is, of course, as I mentioned, history interview taking. Um, and so here at the simulation center um, in uh, health, um, health sciences, which is in that beautiful Lego building, um, we do have 24 clinical rooms, um, which means that we can put lots of students through all at the same time. And here, of course, you're watching an interview. So the person uh, with the clipboard there is actually an examiner or a um, facilitator. And then you see the student with his stethoscope already in place. And um, then you have, of course, our patient. So this here, we have what's called a smart condominium. Um, and everybody would love to live here because it's the perfect condo has everything in it. Um, this is a shared resource actually with another department on campus, um, uh, computers and robotics, because uh, we look into different things that will help people within the home, uh, things that you could use um, to make your life much easier. Um, and so for instance, there's sensors in the floor so that if uh, this person falls and hurts themselves, um, there is an alarm system that goes through to um, hospital, that kind of thing. And so here you see our patient and his wife and two healthcare workers that have come to visit him at home. He's not compliant. He's being very naughty. He's eating lots of chips and um, all over the places, cans and candy wrappers and um, his wife is trying desperately to get him to comply and take his medications, but he's not. So that's why the healthcare workers are there today. So this is um, in a large scenario. We have several large areas where we can run pandemics. We can run large um, hospital corridor scenarios. Um, and large room scenarios. Um, and we can also do emergency, emergency room. And so that's what you're seeing here. What you're um, also something to note is that you're, also, you're seeing in this picture that they're using mannequins. Um, and that's another form of um, simulation using mannequins. Um, our mannequins are very heavy very expensive because uh, they breathe, um, they can bleed, um, they blink, um, their eyes can dilate, their toes and fingers can change color. They can do a lot of things now. And of course, you can have a voice coming out of them as well. Their tongues swell, all kinds of things. 
Um, and so here we also have another of our specialty care rooms. These, this room is for bariatric patients. Um, and uh, we have uh, bariatric suits here um, that are weighted so that um, the standardized patient who is more thin can wear it and uh, create a person who is large. Uh, we also have some uh, large people within um, the standardized patient program, but not all scenarios are good for them to play. In this particular case, he's fallen out of bed and they're trying to get him uh, back into bed. We believe in interprofessional um, work here, which means that we like to bring everybody together so that they understand each other's uh, disciplines. So for instance, here, um, there's a nurse, there's also somebody from uh, physical therapy, um, and then somebody from uh, occupational therapy, and then a doctor as well. So they're all taking part in helping him get back up again. So we also have a critical care room, which is set up for surgery. Uh, we're not what we call a wet lab, where we bring in um, part, real part bodies. What we do is we make them out of rubber. Um, we have fake everything here because it's simulation. So all kinds of fake liquids and uh, fake blood, um, fake pills, um, and uh, they can practice in a safe environment working on uh, different patient skills. So where you can't use perhaps a standardized patient uh, when you want to um, open up a patient, uh, then of course we would use a mannequin. Um, and we also use task trainers as well, which I will show you that's part bodies. So um, here we have um, one of our uh, clinical rooms again. Um, and this is showing what we call hybrid simulation. What that means is, is that we are integrating um, standardized patients with mannequins. So uh, this patient's had two babies, she's had twins, and she's having some complications and she's not, um, she's not comfortable. So in this particular case, uh, the nurse is working with her. Uh, in this particular scenario, uh, this is done in another um, room where we, we call it our resource room. Um, all the rooms here actually at the simulation center are adaptable. We can put uh, together any scenario. So for instance, sometimes we'll do things like hoarding and I will completely fill that smart condominium with boxes and stuff and so they can barely get in there. Um, or we will do, you know, a, a situation where they're being non-compliant and perhaps they haven't changed a dressing for a day or two. There's dirt everywhere and it's, it's just not a nice scenario. So um, the great thing is, is that the students are learning to walk into the room and take a look at the environment. In this particular case, uh, these are paramedics and they have been called because um, this particular patient is having a mental health break. Um, and so uh, they are trying to calm her down and treat her because uh, she's also slashed her wrist as well. In this particular scenario, this is in uh, one of our interview rooms. Um, this is where we get the groups together. So nowadays, when you go to hospital, um, there's always a team that takes care of you, or there should be. And I'm sure Larry's experiencing that right now, where the team gets together and decides on how they're going to handle you. Um, and so uh, this is uh, who we call Mr. Morehouse in the yellow gown um, and his wife uh, sitting next to him. Um, and she's describing why he cannot come home right now. Um, this is a very um, popular scenario here because, of course, the wives or husbands need to advocate for their spouses. And if you can't 
if you can't handle it at home, then you need to say why so that the team can work on keeping them in hospital um, or finding uh, a good location for them to go to um, so that they can um, get better. So here we have, uh, we're using a corridor here. Um, this particular mannequin, we fake everything, like I say, and you can see he's, bit, he's thrown up, um, he's fallen on the ground, um, he's actually, he's cut his head open, but you can't see it in the picture. Um, this would be a good um, simulation for uh, doctors, nurses, paramedics, uh, ambulance drivers, um, anybody who uh, would be at a scene of an accident. Um, so sometimes we do work with people like the police force um, when we do simulation. So we provide realistic and valuable clinical teaching um, in many different areas that I've mentioned. We do interviews, uh, we do history taking, we do physicals. We also do a lot of ethical dilemmas, conflict resolutions, um, and um, the students are learning better communication because of us. Um, in the old days, when I first became a standardized patient back in 1980 something, um, some of the doctors were not comfortable at all talking about end of life and they would leave it to the nurses. And that's very unfair. Um, and you need proper training for that. Um, and so these are the kinds of things that today we're all taking responsibility. And each uh, member of the healthcare team needs to understand um, how better to communicate with every patient. So we do one-on-ones, we do small groups, we do large groups, we do uh, in-class presentations, um, we do video recordings. We also have film groups that come here as well because they like to use our centre because we look like a hospital as well. Mm -hmm. um, for instance, um, a long time ago, I was asked to go along to do um, a role of a schizophrenic person. Unfortunately, the real person who was schizophrenic had disappeared um, and the professor couldn't find them um, within the university. And so I got called out um, to, to go and uh, present the role of a schizophrenic person in front of 200 students. Mm. Um, now, these are things that us in the standardized patient program, we work with all the departments and the faculties so that we understand how to train the standardized patients so that I can better explain to you how we, you would move as a schizophrenic person, what you would be seeing, what you would be hearing, what possibly you would be terribly afraid of, uh, those kinds of things. So we work very closely with each of the departments and the faculties here on campus. We also work with, um, as Guy mentioned, uh, Nate, um, and we also work with McEwen, Braden, Norquest, um, any of the um, health uh, buildings or locations around the city and um, surrounding areas. Yeah. Um, here we have another picture we're showing here. Again, hybrid simulation where you see a wife and her husband um, uh, in the bed there. And then, of course, you're seeing an emergency situation as well, just with a mannequin. Um, and you'll notice the middle one is here says high stakes examinations. And that's what Guy was eliminating to when he said, oh, we do licensing exams. Uh, so when you work licensing exams with us, um, you are paid quite well. Licensing exams pay more than daytime work. Um, but they are on the weekends and most of the training is in the evenings. Um, you do have to be, uh, there are more rules and regulations when you do those types of bookings. Um, you're paid by the hour um, and then you also get all your parking. You don't get a parking allowance, you actually get a parking pass. 
Um, and you get lunch too, they provide you with lunch. So lunch. I know it's a good lunch, isn't it? So yeah, so it's always good to do the licensing exam. And we're sworn to secrecy. Yes, yes, you can't talk to anyone. So uh, some more pictures here demonstrating different types of uh, standardized patient work. Uh, this is a manual lift. Some of you may have seen that before. Um, and again, that's in our uh, specialty care suite. Uh, the other one is also in the specialty care suite, but it's a different, uh, this patient can't breathe. Um, again, these are all standardized patients wearing, we call them empathy suits, but um, quite a lot of times we will get the students to put them on as well, um, so that they understand what it feels like to have a lot of weight on your body. Um, also, what it feels like for, you know, how you would cut something on a, um, on a counter space, um, how you walk downstairs because you can't see your feet. Um, this, this kind of thing, and it's so important to uh, teach them. And so sometimes we have students come from abroad um, and not all countries have weight issues. So when you're thinking of Japan, China, they don't have a lot of large people like we do in America or Canada. Um, and so what happens is, is they're quite surprised and their eyes get quite large when I show them um, our bariatric suite with everything that we have. Our actual, um, the actual, um, the uh, thing that we use to move them around with, um, it can take a weight of a small car. So just to give you an idea. Yeah, yeah. We also have um, very heavy mannequins as well. The fire, firemen like to use them um, because how are you going to get a large person who's 500 pounds out of a window if there's a fire? You know, these are all things that we don't think about as individuals. It's very, very important for them to learn these things. So here you see, um, I've done a, a little bit of a collage here. Uh, this is a, a simulation that we call, yes, uh, can we dance, Dolly? And um, it's, it's a, a lady who has um, Alzheimer's um, and she's very difficult to, uh, to control. And in this particular scenario, she just wants to dance with the doctors and the nurses and she won't do anything she's supposed to do with her therapy. Uh, the other picture is somebody in isolation. Sometimes we'll have the high school schools come um, and we'll get all the kids to put on the yellow gowns and masks and go in and visit a patient who's in isolation. Uh, and that's part of our program to introduce uh, children um, and students, young students um, to healthcare. Um, and get them involved. We want more cultures. We are particularly involved in a lot of indigenous schools um, where we would like to encourage them to come and, and take up medicine. Mm. Um, some more pictures here. I thought you might like to see lots of pictures. So um, more surgery pictures. And then this is what we call a task trainer. In the picture where you see the uh, half body on the ground there, um, sometimes you don't need the whole body to be able to practice and work uh, in your field. And so, you know, and sometimes like when you're practicing injections, uh, we use pads. Um, if, you, if you're going to have, for instance, a standardized patient and it needs, you need to inject something, what they do is they put a false arm beside the standardized patient in the bed so that they're going to inject that false arm and not really the standardized patient. As a standardized patient, um, the students also know respect. We, they don't, we, you know, we might get poked and prodded about and investigated, but um, there is no exposure done um, and there is no um, actual. Um, events like uh, injections. So um, the types of work that we do are with mannequins, with standardized patients, with those task trainers, which are part uh, parts of bodies, 
Um, we also do hybrid, which means that it's one, a standardized patient with another simulation uh, type of equipment, um, or it might just be two pieces of other simulation equipment. Um, but that's what we mean by hybrid. Um, and the, the fifth one that I haven't really talked about much is virtual. Um, and so right now I'm actually involved in um, applying for a grant um, to work more in virtual areas. And the reason for that is, is we're hoping that we can reduce anxiety within students by giving them an opportunity to practice in a virtual environment. The other picture that you see, um, and it's, it's difficult to see the mannequins in them, but uh, that is actually our control, uh, one of the control rooms. Because when the students are working with either mannequins or standardized patients in the room, um, the professors and uh, faculty members are on uh, the other side of one-way glass so that they can't see you, but uh, they can see you and, and the students can't see them. Helps for reality. Um, I'm going to brush past this, actually. Uh, I was hoping that we would have time to do a demonstration, but in order to finish up today, we can do a demonstration another time. Um, and uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to put you through your paces there. <laughs> Oh dear. What I'd like to do is thank you so much for joining me on my tour um, through the Simulation Center and also the Standardized Patient Program. Um, I'm, I'm going to put it in the chat section, but this is my email address. If you'd like more information or you would like the link uh, to um, actually audition and become a standardized patient for a program. If you're not in Edmonton, uh, there are lots of standardized patient programs in every province. Um, all you need to do is take a look at your local um, hospitals uh, or sometimes your universities have a standardized patient program. If you Google it, you'll be able to find the right person to contact in that city. I do know most of them around the country, so if you're having trouble finding uh, perhaps um, a contact in BC or in Ontario, I'm very happy to help you with that because we talk to each other all the time and keep up on our technology. Um, so at this point, I'm going to actually um, change back to the screen so that you can see Guy and I as large people and, and get away from this. Uh, so that I we can take questions from you. Stop sharing. Wow, that's amazing, Betcha. That's, that's so <laughs> impressive. Does anyone uh, in the uh, of the participants have any comments or questions for either Guy or Petra? Yes, I've just asked one. Um, hi, I'm Gina. Hi, Gina. Hello, Guy. <laughs> I'm I'm curious. Guy, you um, flips around medical terminology that I'm unfamiliar with. Do we get uh, orientation and training? You haven't referenced that. Jogging a lot. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, we do when we're doing our homework and preparation and ironically one of the main things they want us to always challenge the students is don't let them use medical terminology on us um mm -hmm. like the the second year students love to oscillate your chest and every time they say it i go what and they go what do you <laughs> i have no idea what that means <laughs> You have to be very careful because what happens is, is as standardized patients, you actually start to learn a lot of medical terms and you start to learn a lot about medicine generally. And that can be dangerous as well. So you have to be very careful how you use it. 
But when you are working as a standardized patient, you need to be just a regular person. So if they say things like, um, well, you're having a myocardial infarction, uh, your, your job is to say, what does that mean? Um, to make sure that they explain everything, because sometimes doctors do use terms that we don't understand, even simple terms sometimes. So, it, you know, it's, it's just, um, yeah, a matter of, I, when we train, I always remind everybody and always say, make sure, you know, you don't use any medical terms and yeah. that um, you ask what everything means. But you don't necessarily have to be a trained actor. Not for at this. All. Actually, so if you're selected, what kind of training and orientation is so the, provided? Yeah, so the first standardized patients were actually uh, not actors. They were, um, you know, just people out of the community. Uh, we have a wide range of uh, people in, in different areas. They either own their own businesses, they're retired, um, they might be students, um, stay-at-home mums and dads. Um, you know, not just uh, trained actors. Um, and so what happens is, is that uh, when you're coming in to train for a role, um, we provide you with a script that you take a look at beforehand. We go through the script. We talk about how, um, how to uh, portray your particular patient. And then we go on and do some practice. Um, and we also uh, teach you how to give feedback. Okay, my other question, I don't want to hog the screen here, but was the time commitment um, per case or once a month or twice a week? Or? So it depends on what you want to get involved in. This is um, contract work. It is not full time okay. And so um, we, usually what I do is I send out emails to those that I think are appropriate for certain roles um, mm -hmm. and say, hey, are you available at this time? You don't always need training for every role. Sometimes you're ad-libbing um, and just be yourself, um, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Because sometimes they just need uh, patients to perhaps do blood pressure. Yeah. Um, or um, just be a physical exam body, um, you know, those kinds of things. So your commitment can be um, a minimum of three hours, um, with, and that might be without training, um, or uh, sometimes I'll have people working all week, um, and, you know, they might have two hours of training. You're paid for both your training and the work that you do. Uh, thank you. I guess I was just concerned with um, other things in your life that are commitments, of travel, um, not being available all the time and how that worked. That's good. Thanks. Um, and also, too, sometimes people get sick. Uh, cars don't start in this weather. Um, and that's when I have to call out somebody in an emergency. So I've got SPs, standardized patients that live close to the university that are willing to hop in and just do a role, even if they are 90 years old and they're playing a 16 year old, there's somebody there to do it. And the students. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Students know Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jenna. Joan, did you have your hand up? Yes. Um, hi, uh, that was really informative. Um, I'm just curious if you could expound a little bit more on ethical dilemmas. You mentioned the, you know, death and dying kind of thing, but what, what would be another example perhaps of a ethical dilemma? Um, religious uh, is another one. We often have uh, things like blood transfusions. Um, also too, um, for the longest time, I used to go out to clinics and act, pretend that um, I was an actual patient and that um, I was in love with my doctor and that um, I'd been trying to get a hold of him um, and, of course, that and make them squirm because, um, you know, they don't know how to, you know, they should know how to handle those things by law. Um, and, of course, everything you talk about is confidential. And so I would cry and I would say, you know, I don't know what to do. And, and um, you know, I, I, I would 
really like to contact this doctor and make it really difficult, that kind of thing. So it's, it's all kinds of legal as well as uh, religious. Um, it might be, um, it, it, it could, well, what, uh, what other ethical? Well, so I had one last week where I was the son and the whole focus of the exam was talking to a family member. And I was not supposed to fess up about my mom's drinking, but my mom was delirious. Um, and they were baffled about what was going on. And they had to ask really good open-ended questions before they would get me to start to tell them the facts about what was going on with my mom. Because I was trying to protect her. I didn't want to violate her privacy and her confidentiality. And uh, it's really hard for the students to figure out when you're guarding and hiding. Um, so it's really a, a really good case scenario for them. Um, thank you. And also one quick question. Do you use child actors at all, like for other scenarios? I'm like sorry. children? Or do, oh. you ever, do you ever use kids as actors? Okay, so we're, we're allowed to use children for licensing exams because they have insurance. And so anybody under the age of 18, um, because often we will, we'll have 11, 12 year olds and, and, and so forth. And um, they will work with the licensing boards. Here at the University of Alberta with the standardized patient program, I cannot use anyone under the age of um, 16 actually, because of our um, insurance. Um, so when we do work for pediatrics and we need someone who's eight or 12 or whatever, they know that there's a certain amount of, um, like when they walk into the room, they, they look at the door, um, see what who they're seeing, 12 year old Joe, um, but actually they're probably seeing 30 year old Peter. Um, but they, as far as they're concerned, they're seeing 12 year old Joe. Gotcha, great, thank you. Go ahead, Karen, we've got, Three yeah, minutes, two and a half. Uh, uh, you, you mentioned first year, second year, and fourth year. Uh, <clears throat> I, once a year, <clears throat> there's a program put on in third year <clears throat> for, to introduce LGBT plus uh, students to, uh, it's a volunteer program. There, there's no money involved, <laughs> except we do get a, a, a gift card, a visa gift card as a thank you for um, exposing ourselves, so to speak, to, uh, a round of third year students. <clears throat> so, and they're always looking for more people to come in uh, from our community and to uh, sometimes shock some of these students who've never met or known to have met somebody from our community. And it's been very well received all around by, uh, by the students for the last couple of years. So it's, um, it, I'm making a pitch in, in order to try to recruit more people to come join me. Well, we don't usually have enough. Anyway, that's, uh, I just want to put a plug in there that there's a third year program as well. It's called The Human Story. And yeah. I've done it for the last five years. And one of the big jokes between my partner and I is that they've never met an elderly gay couple before. And yeah. they're away by the fact that you get old. They thought, they think we live in discos for the rest of our <laughs> lives. And we're going, no, 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 no. It gets really slow and boring. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it was quite an eye opener for, for a lot of the students because they don't realize that we are among them and they don't recognize us until we're in a hospital and they get sidetracked uh, right off you know, the subject of why their, their main complaint. We're coming in now for, with, a, with a fracture or pneumonia and then they, we, we are so exotic they forgot why we're there. But that's, it's, it's been Thank well you, received. Karen. Yeah. So we're we're down to our last 30 seconds. I yeah. want to give you the last word, Petra or Guy. Do you have any events to advertise? Any last? Yeah. Last? Um, I'll just put a pitch in for something I'm doing with the University of Alberta. They're doing an evening on the 13th of March in the Students' Union building at 730 to help anybody who wants information uh, on organizing wills. And it's the first time they've targeted uh, elderly LGBTQ folks. And um, 
It's during the university's Gay Pride. It's one of the opening events for the Gay Pride Week at the U of A. So that's my next next task. No, I have something else not to sleep about. <laughs> <laughs> and I put my uh, email address and phone number in uh, in case anyone wants to chat with me. Well, thank you. That was so inspiring. And thank you to all of you for joining us. I hope we will see you all next week when we will have Hillary Fabrizio, who will discuss legacy giving. You can contact us at agingwithprideyeg at gmail.com. See you all next week. Thanks, everyone.